Good morning and welcome to our very first Let's Talk show from the Institute of Diplomacy and Foreign Relations. Today, we will be talking about foreign policy challenges of 2023. Discussing about foreign policy is like discussing what Donald Rumsfeld said, the known unknown. But we are indeed privileged to have with us today three very prominent panelists to help us unpack the topic that we have in front of us today. First of all, on my right, we will have Tan Sri Said Amir Abba, former Foreign Minister of Malaysia. Welcome back, sir, to the Institute. Thank we you. have missed you very much. Uh, our second panelist is Professor Ruhana Sarun from the National Defence University of Malaysia. Welcome, Prof. Thank you. And our third panelist is uh, Puan Kasturi Pato, former Member of Parliament of Batu Kawan. So I would like to go straight into the topic that we have today, but perhaps we need to have a bit of a chapeau before we proceed further into the very big issues that we're going to discuss today. So without further ado, I would like to begin by asking my former boss, sir, if you could share with us your thoughts on what are the foreign policy changes of 2023 and what are the significance of it to Malaysia? Please, sir. Good morning, Sharil. Thank you very much. First of all, let me say that how uh, privileged I feel to be invited to participate in discussing this a very important and relevant subject of foreign policy. A lot of people think that foreign policy is at the back of Malaysia and it is the domestic policy. But actually, it is our trajectory of the country. It is the ecosystem of the whole country as we project it to the outside world. And because of that, uh, foreign policy become very important no matter what period you are in. So here we look at, you know, I think uh, it's a broad levels of policy outputs that come from our objectives so that people will know our country. Then you look at what type of postures we take on situational issue or issue that has got uh, short term, mid term or long term. That's very important for people to understand the strategies in responding to this. And subsequently, that's the, uh, the action that we take. And that will be able to sell our name, whether at the uh, regional, uh, international level, at the bilateral or multilateral level. And I think Malaysia, because of the situation of a country, actually, we seldom talked about it. But actually, we construct our poli foreign policy. We construct our foreign policy in order to suit this situation. We want to be independent. We want to be uh, known as a sovereign nation. We want to make sure that our national integrity and our national survival. So in short, if you want to sum it up, it's always a question of national interest that is encapsulated in our uh, argument and counter-argument about foreign policy and the position that we take from time to time. Thank you. Thank you, Tun Sri. Very, very succinct. I think you put it very clearly what is the importance of foreign policy in our, in how we built the credibility of Malaysia in the international stage. i particularly attracted to your, the, the particular word that you mentioned just now, we construct our foreign policy. But perhaps I can ask Prof to elaborate further on this. We have had a serious change of government mm. and I believe all the each government try to espouse, perhaps try to give a different nuance, a different emphasis on the foreign policy itself. How, how do you see our foreign policy so far? Have we been consistent or have we, have we been very flexible in terms of approaching the international issues? Please, Prof. Thank you very much. Now, I think uh, about consistency, yes, uh, in principle, uh, we adhere to the principles that we established since 1970, and that's non-alignment. So the principle uh, should not change uh, because it helped Malaysia to navigate, you know, the so many uh, choppy and uncertain uh, environment. Uh, however, um, each government uh, that came in of course, uh, each government would have or would like to project its own focus at the time, its own uh, policy, without deviating from the principles established. And here, the principle is uh, non-alignment. Uh, so I see that uh, the consistency is there. However, 
you have to do or make some um, adjustments uh, according to uh, time, according to period, and also according to the environment uh, that the country uh, face. Uh, another, uh, well, consistency that I find, which I think uh, this one probably needs some uh, change of mindset, is that uh, just now Tan Sri mentioned that, well, uh, discussion about foreign policy has been quite restricted yeah, uh, to some groups only. And um, I think there is a certain reluctance of Malaysians to discuss or project uh, their foreign policy because they think that, oh, we are just a small country. And small countries normally in international affairs don't play much. Uh, role. But that's not right because you have small countries, I mean Switzerland, Denmark, uh, Singapore even, that have been able you know, to project uh, their uh, desires, their wishes in international affairs uh, quite effectively. So I think it's time that uh, we stop thinking, oh, just because you are small, you don't want to you know, uh, project uh, yourself. Uh, like you say, well, chili padi is small, but it's, <laughs> it bites, you know. So I think uh, we need to start thinking that uh, small uh, doesn't mean that you, you cannot play a big role in international affairs. Huh? So. Thank you, bro. The, I am interested that you say that uh, both of the panelists mentioned that we have limited room to discuss about foreign policy. But perhaps among, if we look at the social media recently, there has been so much talk about foreign policy, perhaps whether they understand, whether they appreciate the issue or not. Mm. But people seem to be more inclined to know what is going on in the foreign policy. So perhaps I pose this question to our third panelist, Juan Kasturi Pato. Uh, Prof said that each government tried to put a different focus different emphasis on the foreign policy. And some say that this shows that we are a bit uh, too nimble or too flexible in approaching certain issues. So how do you see this affecting our credibility? Um, thank you to Sharil and to uh, IDFR for having me. It's my second time here. Um, I think it's uh, extremely timely that we speak about this subject, um, given that uh, uh, we have tabled the budget in the parliament and if you look at the budget, uh, as usual, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs does not get as much of a budget that I wish it would get. Uh, and this, I think, is exponential to the discussion on foreign policy um, because it is sort of a subject that many Malaysians, uh, even uh, MPs in Parliament, mm. um, approach this subject very delicately. Um, I think because there's just not much of a conversation on foreign policy. Um, but I think that that under this new government, and as you have rightfully said, all these transitions of government want to project, oh, we want to take this approach and take that approach. But I agree with Prof that fundamentally the principles must be adhered to of a non-aligned. But however, we must state our support or our disdain on certain issues as how we have seen Malaysia voting mm. uh, at, uh, you know, in New York and also in Geneva, particularly on human rights issues. But having said that, being a former MP, um, I think even in Parliament, um, we have not seen much of a conversation through select committees. And this is where check and balance of government policies, approaches, uh, attitudes towards what's happening in the world uh, is taken into consideration. I was a former member of the um, Parliamentary Special Select Committee on International Affairs. Uh, and I think there is a big disconnect with what happens in New York and what happens in Geneva, and what happens in Parliament. And how we always think that it is an executive uh, uh, um, process, which I agree, to a great level, it's academics, it's executive, but where does Parliament come in, come in all this? How do we hold the government accountable for its policies, its stand, and its statements? Uh, for example, on, on Russia and Ukraine. Um, the former government uh, did not mention the word Ukraine at all in their statement, which I think, if, even if you don't take sides, you know, you have to, to call out uh, a, a breach of, of uh, um, you know, sovereignty 
uh, onto sovereign land as what Russia has done to Ukraine, etc. Uh, and it, in this time and age, you know, it is just not acceptable for any country to claim ownership or to, to infringe into another country and say, you know, we have a right to do it. You know, how do you maintain uh, um, peace and order in the world if every country thinks that I can do this and no one can question me on it? And I, as what Prof also said, this chili padi uh, um, example, I remember my mother telling me this back in 1973 in one of the Miss Universe or Miss World pageant, mm. South Africa sent two participants because they still had apartheid, one black and one white. And Malaysia, amongst many other countries, and when I say many, I mean just a small group of about nine countries, I think, that said, we are going to withdraw because we don't believe in the apartheid you know, principle. And who would have thought Malaysia, a country that is so far away, would have such a firm stand on discrimination? So it is true that we really adhere to this uh, Chili Padi policy and... Now, being in the UN Human Rights Council, I think Malaysia has really upped her game and you can see how we vote and how we make our, our voices heard, uh, not just in New York, but in Geneva as well. Thank you, Puan Kasturi. So, we have heard three panellists today discussing about the, perhaps, try to identify the challenges of our foreign policy. We are ready now to take a deep dive to discuss further on the issue of uh, international challenges of 2023. Uh, we will take a short break after this, but after the break, we will be discussing about uh, Malaysia, ASEAN, and perhaps touch a bit on Indo-Pacific issues. Welcome back to our Let's Talk Foreign Policy Challenges 2023. We will now begin talking about issue that is very close to us, which is about ASEAN. So I believe I would like to pose a question to Tan Sri. Uh, how should we perceive ASEAN at the moment? We had a bit of setback when we had the pandemic COVID-19. Uh, ASEAN was criticized because of our slow response in coming up with a community approach in dealing with pandemic. So now we are reeling after the post-pandemic era how can we leverage on ASEAN to pro how can we leverage on the relevance of ASEAN to protect our interests? Please, Thank sir. you very much. Very interesting that we have decided now to move to our own region mm. where it matters most. But ASEAN, I think there are two points of view that you can look at. Uh, as a regional organization, many consider it as a successful regional organization that has been able to sustain and survive until now. Uh, and because of that, people say that we are successful. At the same time, ASEAN also focus on more cooperative thing. Uh, we, uh, we tend to do things uh, very carefully and cautiously that sometimes the observers of ASEAN or our, re our dialogue partners feel that because of our position of neutrality or non-interference or non-intervention, mm. that we tend not to be committed to anything. Mm. So I, we, we seem to be holding to what I think in the evolution of our foreign policy, uh, ASEAN, it, takes, it, it doesn't want to be involved in political matters. In economic matters, we find more comfortable. So our social, cultural, we find more comfortable. In security, uh, there is a lot of nervousness, but we do have joint exercises on maritime, on land. But on the political side, when it comes to uh, the, our either multilateral or on issues of importance like human rights issue or even Ukraine for that matter, you know, I mean, Ukraine, we took a position, we say we are worried about the possible nuclear war. That is a very good information. But the thing that has been inundating and sometimes considered as an impediment for us is our non-interference and non-intervention policy. And uh, you see at Nargis, Nargis, yes, there was a collective efforts. And we know that diplomacy for regional organization has to be collective efforts. There must be a common position. We don't seem to be a, have a common position. And uh, when it comes to COVID, we didn't treat it like we did with the 
ASEAN influenza, if you remember. You know, ASEAN flu, you know. Yeah. Where we had an emergency meeting, all the haze, or the fire situation, where we, all the foreign ministers meet, and we came up with a statement. So I think uh, we, we have problems. But at the end of it, we must think ourselves that we cannot be a strong force of influence unless we act as a regional body. I would like to see that ASEAN have a position on Ukraine. And I, I think a lot of people go back to the principle on Ukraine, Russia. I, I tend to look at it differently on, on this position because it, the challenge is how do we discipline major powers mm. to respect international law? How do we avoid mm. double standards and selectivity being used? You know, when it, uh, would you like to see the repeat of what happened in the uh, Cuba, you know, during the Kennedy and Khrushchev? It was so close. They have got the nuclear thing in Cuba and America insists. But now America is giving existential threat to Russia and then we blame Russia. I think we need to be balanced. That's why in foreign policy, we say Malaysia and ASEAN generally, we take this, this uh, trying to balance. Even in Indo-Pacific, people say we do not have any commitment, but we are balancing. Or sometimes uh, we tend to be bandwagoning, looking at, you know, and we also hedge. Hedge is national interest for us. We were worried when, you know, but I think the three principles, if we talk about ASEAN, we should discuss the challenge is we always consider sovereign equality as important. We consider non-recourse to force, to the use of force is important. That's why Treaty of Amity and Cooperation comes in into the picture. And then we consider non-interference and non-intervention. And then uh, we do not want to be involved in the internal affairs. No? or bilateral conflict of ASEAN country. At the end of it, we concluded by saying, let us solve it by quiet diplomacy. Mm. Even by quiet or non-quiet diplomacy, there have been a lot of breaches of human rights that we have ignored. We have made use of the human rights uh, body in Jakarta more as an education. We can start education when it began, but no longer education. How do we deal with abuses? How you deal with human uh, humanitarian law abuses? How do you deal with genocide? You know, uh, crime against humanity. So all these things. So I think we still have got a long way. But ASEAN is still there, still successful. We should not try to ignore it, that it, it, it doesn't function. It functions, but there are handicaps, there are weaknesses. But we must reinforce the, our strength in order to overcome our weaknesses. Thank you. Thank you, Toshi. It's very interesting that you... I, I feel that you hold very firm to the values of ASEAN, non-interference, the respect of the sovereign of, of the members. But how do we go forward from there? Perhaps this question is for Prof. How do we talk about the violation that is happening in the Russia-Ukraine war, violation of human rights in other parts of the world, where we are on, on Myanmar on this? Okay. Uh, before we go further, I would like to just add uh, something to what Tan Sri has said. Number one, I think we should remember that ASEAN is not EU. Many people say, oh, uh, why EU is already running and ASEAN is just walking or even uh, crawling. We are in a different situation and uh, we, the end, we, we want a different thing. Uh, uh, so I think this uh, must be uh, remembered. EU is an organization that is, one, I think it's litigious, and secondly, that it's very, very uh, strict. They have strict rules what each country or member should follow, should not do, etc., etc. In ASEAN, we, we're not like that. We, we are more flexible. Uh, we have certain flexibility because, um, as you know, the we are based on, well, number one, as Tan Sri mentioned, non-interference policy, and that we have agreed right from the beginning. And secondly, this organization uh, is based on, uh, unless they have changed it, on muafakat and mushawarah, yeah? uh, consensus, agreement, etc. And to get a muafakat mushawarah, 
to arrive at a consensus, it's difficult. And um, ASEAN is made up of 10 countries with a different political system, a domestic uh, system, and uh, multi-religion, uh, 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 languages, etc., etc. So we are based on actually, if you look at it, on uh, three major civilizations. Huh? But Europe, they have already said that Europe is based on Judeo-Christian uh, civilization and ideas. So it's much easier for them uh, to, to conduct things because at the bottom, uh, well, they have certain commonalities. So we function quite successfully in this kind of environment that needs, you know, negotiations, uh, navigations here and there. So I will not dismiss uh, ASEAN as a failure, as some people. I mean, Europeans, they say, oh, compared to us, you are slow. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, we walk or we run at our own pace and uh, according to our own uh, needs and uh, desire. So we say, well, you cut your baju uh, according to your cloth, isn't it? Uh, so, um, and uh, just now you and Tansri brought out the issue of what are ASEAN's position on certain issues. The same thing. Uh, if you see on certain issues, ASEAN sort of hesitated to come out as a position, ASEAN position. For example, look at uh, Myanmar. Yes, uh, we all agree something is not uh, right. However, it's very difficult to, for ASEAN to come out uh, with a single agreed position. Why? Because Myanmar is a member of ASEAN. Uh, it's like you, you pinch your right hand and your left hand would feel uh, the pain. And secondly, in ASEAN, as in the East, uh, we do things through not the European way, liturgies, but there's a certain manner, uh, face saving, uh, you know, you, you don't just say, oh, uh, you know, you are no good or you are ugly. No, there are certain ways of uh, saying it. So it might take a longer time, but I think um, we, because of that, uh, you know, this uh, muafakat, mencari muafakat, and it takes a longer time. That's why uh, ASEAN has not endangered itself, uh, you know, on certain issues, committing uh, itself. But it doesn't mean that uh, we don't do anything. Yeah? Uh, on Myanmar, it, it was very, very difficult uh, on the two issues, very important in Myanmar. One is the Rohingya. Yeah? Uh, so states in ASEAN, have uh, what we call varying degrees of response to the Rohingya uh, problem because they were not affected in the same manner. I mean, Vietnam was actually not uh, affected at all, but Malaysia very much affected by the uh, refugees. So that's why Malaysia came uh, forward, you know, and very, very openly, uh, very critical of the policies of the uh, Myanmar government even under Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, she didn't say much uh, about uh, refugee uh, problems. So no difference between the military government and the civilian government. Now, second issue about uh, Myanmar is the, the coup, the military coup of 2021. Uh, did ASEAN make uh, a position, a common position? No. I don't remember uh, uh, that ASEAN make. However, uh, ASEAN says, well, uh, you know, there are certain things that you can uh, do and some countries are more vocal than others. Uh, now, people say, oh, uh, why a military coup uh, government is not right? Now, I would like to remind people that Thailand had so many military coups come and go. Did ASEAN ever criticize Thailand? Uh, did we ever break off uh, diplomatic relations with Thailand because of the military uh, coup? Uh, so it's up 
to that country uh, to see whether that government is suitable, you know, for that country at that certain period uh, of time. So I think, uh, yes, uh, you talk about human rights. I mean, human rights are violated everywhere. Where were you when uh, the United States invaded uh, Iraq, when they invaded uh, Libya, or you want to go far back? Vietnam, they destroyed the whole country. So uh, to me, while well, talking about uh, human rights uh, we, we, and, and uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, I think uh, Ukraine, Russia is a very delicate uh, issue. Uh, the problem is not, uh, you know, that uh, Russia, uh, yes, uh, physically they went over to Ukraine, but you have to look at the problem where it start. It's historical. Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union and then it left. So it's almost like an internal uh, problem. They have domestic uh, problem. And secondly, very important, I think, uh, as a student of international affairs and national security, if you send a tiger right at my bedroom door, what do I do? Do I open my bedroom and say, okay, come in, or I do something? Now, NATO has been pushing Ukraine, uh, and the Ukraine government has been so anti-Russian. So what should Russia do? Tolerate it? I don't know. Thank, thank you for, for uh, thing. we are very passionate talking about ASEAN and human rights violation around the world. So I believe this is a topic that we need to discuss further. So, but before we go, uh, let, let's take a break for a moment. Then perhaps we can continue with Puan Kasturi after this to discuss more about our position on, on Myanmar after this. Thank you, Prof, for your views on where we are with ASEAN right now. But just playing a devil's advocate here, I, I sense a bit of contradiction with what you and perhaps Tan Sri said just now about what we need to do with ASEAN and what we are saying about the issue in, in Myanmar. I believe that before we were very pronounced, we were very strong in criticizing the Myanmar government. But now people say that we are a bit uh, silent on, on the issue. Uh, perhaps Puan Kasturi can, can elaborate further on this. Where, where, where do we stand on this, actually? Thank you. Um, I think this is also timely to address. Um, uh, we have seen the, um, the transitions of government, military, what happened to Aung San Suu Kyi, pre-post of her coming into power, a democratically elected government, the overthrowing of that government, the junta taking that place, and now with them declaring that the political party, the NLD, is, uh, uh, you know, doesn't exist anymore. They have dissolved it. Um, and uh, I just want to touch on what Tan Sri and Prof have said. Uh, on the principle of non-interference, unfortunately, um, being in ASEAN means that whatever happens domestically in any country has a danger of a spillover effect economically and also on human rights in the region. Uh, and us being one of the 10 countries that make up ASEAN, have a duty to speak up when something happens in another country, as other countries also render support to what happens in the country or comments of, of uh, uh, domestic affairs. Now, we must understand that domestic policies and domestic laws have the ability to influence, or they do influence foreign policies, and that has um, an act of attracting or repelling how the world sees Malaysia or how Malaysia fits into the world. You know, very simply, um, I think that uh, our former foreign minister, uh, Dr. Sri Saifuddin Abdullah, did a lot of good work. I mean, he by far has been the foreign minister that has reached out to the NUG to engage with them. Yeah. Now, in my opinion, I think um, Dr. Sri Anwar also has really led the way in discussions on how we can resolve, resolve is a very strong word <laughs> in ASEAN, but how we can participate to ensure that what happens in Myanmar doesn't escalate, you know. I think our role here is to de-escalate what is going on in Myanmar from an ASEAN point of view. And I think some of the first steps that we can do is to recognize the NUG and to engage with them. Now, I must also share with you all that 
The ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, which is an NGO, a very active NGO in the region, have reached out to the European Parliament to, to after they have done a lot of uh, study, uh, engagement with other parliaments as well, to present a paper on what they have observed and how to move forward. And I also must state here that the Junta has to some degree uh, accepted some of these recommendations, which is to address one of the main issues in Myanmar, which is to recognise the Rohingyas and other minorities there, which is because they don't recognise them, is causing them to be treated as foreigners and or refugees coming to Malaysia. Um, but, having but, but, failed that, this, this, when you see about, it's about trust. It's sure. about trust. We expect, we want them to trust, to recognise yeah. the minorities in the country. Yeah. But is ASEAN play giving the same uh, trust to them? We we are not even inviting them to ASEAN summit. Yes. We don't maintain the engagement door that we used to do. We are encroaching. We, are we abandoning the the, no. the spirit of and ASEAN in this? I, I think if I can yeah, intervene a but little bit. So I just finish, finish it, Tan Sri. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you know are why? the expert Because in this, I, I feel that there is no such thing as non-interference or non-intervention carte blanche. Yes. No. Yes, I agree. You know, And then we must put it sub to conditions. If there is a genocide, Crimes against sure, humanity, sure. violence and human rights. Of it's course. not a question of you can do. And the, uh, the last one that is important, what both of them are saying is that, yes, there is no interference, but if it has got spillover yes, effects sure. on us, it affects our security, it affects our safety, then we must yes. have got a right yes. to it. Yes. Uh, we have got a right to, to do something. Not that we didn't do anything. The five-point consensus, for yes. example. Yes. Yes. There is a five-point exactly, consensus. Really but this five-point consensus, Myanmar, the history of Myanmar is that they are very good at agreeing in meetings, but and they never implement what they have agreed yeah. to. So what do you do? We don't have... Uh, the United Nations cannot do right to protection for the... Rohingya, sure. they cannot intervene because their big powers will, you know. Yes. So all kind of things. Even on the case of Palestine, as you see, yes. China and Saudi Arabia yes. sponsored a resolution. But uh, US, you know, we do it. Sure. So I think everything goes back to the most important thing, in my view, is that the international system and the international order needs reform. Okay. It cannot go yeah. on like this. Mm. And uh, this is the, uh, the the product of the Second World War. Yeah. And we are li living in a product of Second World War where might is right. And I don't agree with that one. So, yeah. sorry, no, no, Tansri, thank you for that. Mm. Um, so I agree. You know, there are countries that are legitimizing the Junta military. Okay. And that is making it hard for ASEAN to make a breakthrough also in Myanmar. These are countries that have a lot of influence in ASEAN as well, namely China and Indonesia. They fund the junta military, they aid them with arms, and they are legitimizing that government. But they are not part of ASEAN. We, ha we are part of ASEAN. So mm. you find these two superpower houses supporting the junta military and us trying to engage with them. And I must also say, they are not totally cut off from meetings. Huh? They do attend meetings. Because it is also their right, they claim you know they are the yeah. rightful government of Myanmar, uh, and they do attend meetings. The thing is, on on the other hand, we also need to engage with the NUG. That is the government that the people elected, and and a hundred years ago, slavery was something that was norm in many parts of the world. Today, we frown upon slavery, and it's a crime in so many countries. You cannot say that because a country did it fifty or hundred years ago, it is acceptable today. No. You know, infringing into a sovereign land is a no-no today. You know, it doesn't justify whatever the reason behind it. There is a table for diplomacy. You can bring it to that table. You cannot say that because you don't adhere to what I say, I have the right to therefore enter your country and give you hell for one year. Whether we're talking about Ukraine or whether we're talking about NUG. No, that and one I, 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 I like to intervene. <laughs> I think what, what our professor is saying just now, what happened if you have got a tiger right in front of your house? You cannot go out. So you must do something. I think sure. now at present, the international system is so imbalanced that we are only looking at those who make the thing happening. Mm -hmm. But we must also want the people who cause 
a war to start yes. to be blamed. I agree. Equally, they have to be blamed. Sure. I think in this one, if you see the American scholars, American societal leaders, now they are all saying that this war is avoidable. This conflict yes. is avoidable. It's all the American that have started it. Uh. And under international law, let us go back to law since we talk about law. Under international law, mm. you cannot supply a country in conflict in the United Nations Charter with yeah. 30 billion of arms. Yes. Oh, but Tan Sri, it's happening Worth in Yemen. Arms. That's what I'm saying. No, no. It I'm happened saying in Yemen too. I'm about the international system. Yes. Yeah. I'm, true, I'm not true. saying that I, you know, I, you know yeah. the fact that one wrong is committed somewhere doesn't, doesn't give make the it right. Excuse, yeah. make it right. I agree. No, I'm, I, that's uh, sure. what I'm saying. I'm so yes. uh, this, let, this is the beauty of uh, talking about foreign policy. We can't see. We can't discuss uh, a particular issue in, in isolation. No, sure. it will yeah. be connected with there different issues altogether. Uh, but but Tansri, I'm so sorry. But mm. uh, allow me to um, ask question to to no, please, please about, about, about Myanmar, no. perhaps. But perhaps uh, can can I just continue with uh, <laughs> Ukraine a bit? I please just roll. came back from Paris, and you know you feel suffocated because the war is being fought, not in just in Ukraine, but in the media, I see. Yes. in the Western media and also in the capitals of Europe and the West. Uh, well, mm. Tansri mentioned how many billions or millions of euros uh, go to buy arms for the uh, Ukraine. Not just that, they're asking people in the street you know, demonstrating support for Ukraine. Why? It's not because uh, they love the Ukraine so much. This is about power politics. Mm. This, the Ukraine war did not start as a proxy war, but it has been made into that by the Americans and the uh, EU and the Europeans, uh, NATO. So uh, this is where we are. So I think when you discuss Ukraine-Russia war, we have to be a bit, uh, you know, objective uh, and not l look at the reasons why uh, it happened. Uh, anyway, we, st we have already stated our position. Malaysia says, well, we are neutral, but we still hope for peace. And that, that's good. I mean, look. Why do you want to uh, think uh, or commit uh, on one side uh, in a war that happens 10,000, 15,000 kilometers away and between two countries, we have good political relations with Russia and Ukraine. However, what kind of uh, national interests do we have besides that? We don't have much trade uh, with them. So best position is let's uh, remain neutral but with the hope, peace will come. And peace is coming, I, I can Shalom, tell you. Inshallah, inshallah. I can <laughs> just make a comment on that, sure. please. Uh, um, I think that uh, as a foreign policy, the country also has to be consistent uh, in our views on violations of human rights. Um, our, our stand has been extremely firm on the Palestinian issue. Mm. Uh, I would, I, I, actually, I don't want to use the word issue. It is a crisis already there. It's a global crisis of what's happening in Palestine, um, and our stand back in the 80s on the Bosnian uh, uh, crisis as well, the humanitarian crisis. Uh, Malaysia took a very um, uh, frontline viewpoint uh, and played a very active role in engaging and being the mediator between countries during the Bosnian humanitarian and uh, crisis. And also with the whole Palestinian issue, I mean, even parliament plays an important role. We have um, caucuses, you know, led by... Now you have established caucus, Yes, exactly. Right? So, the thing is, caucus. when... And Palestine is not in ASEAN. It is also thousands of miles away. And more and more Malaysians are looking at this conservative, rigid Israeli government. And even non-Muslims and non-Malays today are condemning it. The world is condemning it. They can also see it. But they also choose to be silent. Now, my, my point here is that if we think that what is happening in Palestine must be something that we all collectively condemn, then I think what Russia has done to Ukraine, whether it has American hands behind it or not, whether it has Chinese hands behind it, that's, that's, that's another thing. But in this time and age, to say that I was provoked and therefore this is my reaction, you know, it's something that is, in my opinion, unacceptable in this time and age because that will create a horrible domino effect to any other part of the world. 
Um, no. You know, and no, I I disagree. No. Uh, no, Malaysia di- does not say that. Uh, no, but we cannot no. choose neutrality. You must say no, I, I, that I, I, what I, Russia that, has let, done. Malaysia to does not support a violation of, of human many, rights. I agree. Yes. However, as a foreign yeah. policy position, mm. we do not want to take sides uh, with Russia or Ukraine. But there is a next clause that you should see that uh, yes, uh, we hope for peace. Uh, we, of course, I agree with uh, that. We don't uh, condone uh, human yes, rights exactly. violations. Let, let, me, let me just uh, say before, uh, because the time is about to be up, but let me just say that I think whatever it is, the most important thing is you want to find peace and reconciliation. Sure. Okay? Malaysia's foreign policy is always premised on three things. One is to be principled. Yeah. And I think uh, we are right in the case of Ukraine. But at the same time, we express our disagreement with the US not trying to find a solution. Sure. I think the other one is we want to be uh, consistent, and which we have been mm. in all issues, from appetite yes. uh, in the South Africa sure. until now. No sure. uh, appetite, that's why. And then the last one is at the same time, this is what Prof mm. always say in her case, to be pragmatic. But I don't think we can ignore what is expected. Uh, happening outside our borders. Sure. Because the situation in Ukraine, even though it's very far and nothing to do with us, is going to affect geopolitical as sure. well as geoeconomic. It's going to uh, cause the world punya economy to suffer and we will suffer. Right. We are a trading nation. We affect, you know, that, I yes, think that is an inter... Connectivity. So yeah. you mentioned just now, how do we manage these superpowers? Mm. I think this is really interesting because dictators learn from each other, dictatorships learn from each other, and if Russia can do this and get away with it, you know, there's no telling which other country will also look and say that recipe, that formula worked for them. You know, we've had a long-standing issue with our neighbor, and it's time that we act this way. Um, and I think that it's time that we don't. You know, for many years, we, I, I as a child grew up with looking at many of these other countries in Europe and America especially to be like, uh, you know, defenders of justice and defenders of human rights, etc. But you have seen human rights violations and abuses yeah, in these true. countries as well. So I think it's time that we look into, back at ourselves, of what our, uh, um, how we view what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights means and how we adhere to it. And above all, to learn from best practices and to learn from mistakes that other countries have made to ensure Malaysia doesn't do it and we make sure that it doesn't happen okay. in the region. Thank, thank you, Pankashri. You, you raised a very pertinent point here. But having discussed all this, we, we have to recognize that there is a mismatch of attention given to the crisis in Ukraine mm. to other crises around the world. Yes. That is something we, we, sure. we I, I think perhaps we can explore this further after yep. this. So okay, we, we have really discussed about, about this, that perhaps after this we can, I, I don't think I can pull the discussion further not to touch about Ukraine yeah, yeah, yeah. and perhaps we can also touch about China <laughs> yeah, after this. Yeah. So okay, let, let's take a break for a moment. Sure. Welcome back. We are still on the Let's Talk Foreign Policy Challenges 2023. We have covered quite a bit on uh, Myanmar issues and Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, I would like to perhaps the panelists to invite the panelists to perhaps discuss about where we are in relation to China and U.S.-China rivalry. I think that's that's a big issue on this. We talked earlier, Tanshri, about our approaches in foreign policy about hedging, bandwagoning, mm. and everything. Mm. But in your your, if you can share your perspective, Tanshri. Where we are heading in China? Mm. Are we leaning towards China, or where where we are now? I think uh, you know. Sorry, I just like to go back to our original philosophy of forming ASEAN. Our philosophy of forming ASEAN in 1967 was to make sure that ASEAN is not a theater of big power rivalry. They will never use our our place. But now we, this has changed. Because, you know, even on the South China Sea, South China Sea is actually, we have all recognized, including the US, China, the right of freedom of passage. Yes. But freedom of passage mm-hmm. does not build, or does not mean a military buildup. Mm. 
there is always an overlapping claims on those area, you know, and, and let us distinguish between overlapping claims on the South China Sea and the continental share of the EE zone, the, uh, the exclusive economic zone, mm. exclusive economic zone is recognized under the UNCLOS 1982 as part of our, you know, sovereign rights to mm. exploit mm. and explore. So the problem at present is US always look at China as their competitor. Yeah. The That's US policy of hegemony seems to be waning. It's not, you know, it's not working now. Dominion is not working anymore. And China being Asian, I mean, so to speak, Asian, they accommodate, you know, they don't only make words, but they bring in economic development and all sorts of things. So US feel that they are being replaced. So this competition, the rivalry, has caused US to form Indo-Pacific, Indo-Pacific, Outcoast, and the Woods, mm -hmm. all in order to contest against China. I think a lot of things can be reduced yeah. if US adopt the policy of cooperation. Mm -hmm. I think the policy of cooperation is very good. ASEAN is put in a difficult place. Mm -hmm. You cannot yeah. be, you're with me or you're not. Yes. And US must accept that they are no longer the sole hegemonic or dominant power. Let us pray now. Now there is new multipolar. There is also mini polar people talking about. Mm. So I think we, uh, we are moving to a new world. Mm. So I, I, I think it's about time that mm. US settle down to saying, okay, we'll cooperate. It is for the betterment of the world. You know, so uh, at present, I think China is not doing anything, but China has cleverly used its economic strength, its financial strength, in order you there will be a, a Berlin Queens Ganzhou train to Berlin. Mm, you know. Yes. And that one will take 30 hours to reach Berlin instead of the six months. This is connectivity. Yeah. And so I, I, I believe that we should but that's true to mm. say that the United States is not cooperating with China. It's also I it's also a the notion is a bit difficult because of the the closeness of their economy. I think their economy is their tie is about, about seven hundred billion. So it's it's how how do we how do we say because in terms of economy they are very close, but at the same time when it comes to rule of law, become <laughs> issues, they become to be so far apart. So how do how do we let's go back to economics? How do we then we'll do? be very close to each other? You know <laughs> how how do we balance this out, Prof? If I can ask uh... you on this. First, where I would where do like, we stand in US-China relations? Uh, yes, first I would like to say that yes, uh, I agree with uh, most of the things that uh, Tan Sri has said. And a very important one is that the United States uh, does not want to accept challenge mm. to its uh, dominance. Mm. Uh, you know, it's you are used to being a king and now suddenly uh, <laughs> some young prince coming up. Uh, so the United States does not want to accept a uh, challenge to its uh, dominance. Secondly, uh, the US-China rivalry in the region, I think as far as Malaysia is concerned, uh, we have uh, the right uh, attitude in the sense that we have told everybody that uh, please don't ask us to take side, yeah. uh, whether on China or uh, US. And that's what uh, we have been doing. And we should not take side because both are our friends. Uh, US is a long-standing traditional friends. Uh, one time our largest trading partner. And China is uh, relatively a new friend, but a friend. And more important, China is in your backyard. Huh? Yes. You, mm -hmm. you have to accept that yep. um, proximity, the yep. geographical proximity. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, the U.S. might be 20,000 kilometers away, but mm. they have bases and friends in the region. Yeah. So, I mean, why are you so afraid of China? I'm asking the United States. You have everything, <laughs> yes. Politically, uh, geopolitically, militarily, the U.S. is still number one. Controls okay. the entire, almost entire planet. Uh, uh, a king so, doesn't like another king to sit on the same yeah. throne. <laughs> So but, the, but, but very, very true, Paul. But, yeah. but we, we can't deny that the region has become a stage for major power. And if you look at the past, how Malaysia and particularly mm. the ASEAN responded to this, we have introduced 
we, we always come up with new novelty to handle this, this, this competition. We come up with uh, non-aligned movement. We come up with DAC. Yep. We come up with ASEAN. We even established the ARF. So East, perhaps East Asia, East, Summit, uh, East Asia Summit. Perhaps Talking I can. Talking about the stage, there are two kinds. Mm. One is the stage uh, mm. that you create, you know, in your mind politically, okay. and the other is the stage where it's played. Now, which one is ours now? Sure. It's the one that oh, uh, uh, you create, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, actually, you know, I think in this current position, if you ask the question before I. I think to give to be fair to her, <laughs> you know, I you know why because I think at present the the most foreign policy is your trajectory and perceptions of yeah, others on what you do. At present, as far as the West is concerned, and scholars of international is concerned, Malaysia seems to be see, seen to be leaning slightly towards. China. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that is what, you know. Yeah. This has actually started yes. during Najib's time. Eh, dah, dah, uh, dah mula. But the last visit, successful visit uh. of our PMX, mm. yeah. clearly demonstrated to the mm. American. You must remember, he hasn't yeah. visited US, you know. That's right. He has gone to the... Yeah. And it was an overwhelming, uh, coined as the overwhelming yes. success story of uh, the Prime Minister's yeah. foreign policy yep. in going overseas. Mm. So I think uh, then you interpret from there. Yeah. But Juan Kashiri, you want you want to add to add to that about how how we can play a role in managing the the US China rivalry in this region? Um, I think Malaysia and um, other countries in the region, but I'll speak about no. Malaysia. Uh, is often yeah, stuck in a conundrum yeah, when yeah, new yeah, presidents yeah, sure, in America yeah. have new policies yeah. and new approaches. Yeah. How uh, President Trump dealt with China, how President Trump dealt with North Korea, um, you know, has a disastrous effect on our relationship among countries in mm -hmm. ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So it's not just us stating our stand, and I agree with Prof, that we don't take sides in this case, but we must also be principled in what we believe in uh, and not be afraid to voice out when we have to. Uh, and I think this is where um, that I, I like to use the term on our terms comes in. It, it could be very strong and to a certain degree and extent undiplomatic when we say, yes, we will go into this agreement with you, but it also has to be on our terms. Now, I think this is where the best interest of Malaysia comes in. Uh, and um, at the end of the day, our domestic policies, our approach and our attitudes to our relationship, whether it is economical, bilateral or multilateral, to other countries, in particular to China, uh, must also take into account you know, our sensitivity and what, what is important to us. Um, I don't want to use the word big brother, um, but sometimes uh, as a uh, our famous Name We. Name We has written a song on China's very fragile heart. And I find this so funny because they appear to be this powerhouse in Asia, a powerhouse in the world, and yet they get tersinggung with many little, little things that happens, whether it's balloons in the air, whether it is a ship that is seen in the sea, whether it's a plane. <laughs> you know, to have a fragile heart. Um, I also think that Malaysia should um, call out frauds uh, when we see one. Uh, we Over the decades, we often look at countries, particularly in the US and Europe, you know, as uh, being um, moral, the moral authority on many issues. Uh, but just as a side story, you know, US still remains one of the countries that hasn't, si hasn't ratified the Conventions right. on the Rights of Child. No. This is fundamental, so you know. They yes. they, that one, they haven't signed, Tansri. No. So, I think we have to review back how we look at these countries. Maybe at once upon a time, they were the you know moral authority on justice, and you know they abolished slavery, etc., which then had a great spillover effect, not just in the region but to the world. But I think we also need to check you know uh, um, how we look at these countries at this point in time. You know, uh, I, I think, think having know, a neutral like, stand uh, is following up on from what she said. I think you might remember that I consider that. China. We haven't discussed India at all. Yes. We haven't touched on Africa. Africa mm. is going to be a mm. very important continent. Sure. Yes. It's, it's going to sure. be, you know, and their attitude now is changing. Yes. Their attitude is changing. And, you know, China and India is not just a new world power. 
is they are mm. re emerging what they yes, were before yes, yes. that's right so these are all important yeah, sure. important issues you know and uh, they are going to and i think it's just question of us i feel you know which is history he has got a 200 years history you compare to all these countries and everything they have got thousands of years of history yes, yes, so it true. must be you must take a collective diplomatic position yes. that we can, the world is big enough for us to share that there is a need for co prosperity there is a need for us to establish peace mm-hmm. because there's so much hungry people in the world yes. there's so much refugees why must you go and spend so much money on arms and all sorts mm-hmm. and create war in order to make sure your defense industry will continue yes. to grow yeah. and become big so i i i think uh, china now my own experience dealing with china china before when they were developing country with us in asean is different from china now china as a big power is different from china then, before yes. you know i uh, so i think um, so there I, must be changing you know you must you must change the dynamics is in the the challenge is in the dynamics of the international landscape i, I, I think we are, we are wanna, a bit short on time but i just want to Yeah. mention something that has not been mentioned before uh, it's on climate change and how governments oh. are going to react to it um, and that is another subject perhaps on another Long day subject. but we need to speak on the direct impact of climate change where rising sea levels would mean that many countries would be submerged mm. underwater yeah. in the next years to come which means god forbid if one day it happens in malaysia we will all have to find a place where we will then be economic refugees or we will be you know uh, climate refugees uh, to other countries and i think this is where we have not spoken about on foreign diplomacy on how we are going to manage this in the region uh, where you have influx and movement of people uh, foreign policy and refugee issues i'm very concerned about climate change this and foreign is what policy i i i want i would like to go back to the my my statement earlier about that problems of the world are not receiving equal attention Uh, as much as the problem no, in Russia and Ukraine at the moment, uh, sure. the, the the emphasis and the attention given is is not the same, yes. and and I think there's something that we need to 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 look at and perhaps discuss this a bit further. But actually, like you mentioned and Prof mentioned also that this we have we are facing two battles on our hand. One mm-hmm. is the battle that is happening on the ground, mm-hmm. and the second is also a battle of narratives. Mm-hmm. So perhaps sure. before we before we end the session, perhaps sure. may I invite very quickly each of the panelists to mm-hmm. perhaps give a One minute recap about what we have discussed okay. so far about the foreign policy challenges. Uh, well, one I, minute, I, please. I, I will do quickly. I think mm. what we fail to do all this time is that we do not write our own narrative. We must write our own narrative on foreign policy and look at the challenges and see the dynamics, the ecosystem of the international mm. order and international. Mm. Look at it at that, mm. including on environment and other things. Then. It will. We can give a fairer and more balanced treatment of all the issues yeah. that is important to us. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Uh, just now we talk about sort of reforming the international system. I would like to sort of uh, remind us all that we are in a period where we do not control uh, that international system, okay. so we are forced to abide by the rules and laws. Uh, set or established by this uh, international system so uh, of course it has flaws it has a lot of uh, problems for smaller countries you know to abide uh, by the current uh, international system so what do we do i think uh, as a small country it's very difficult you know for malaysia to work alone so i think we should uh, sort of go back uh, before uh be among you know countries big or small or medium uh, that would like to change uh, or reform not change but reform the international system so i think malaysia could be uh, part of it if not uh, lead uh, you know the thing thank you prof uh, one gesture please thank you sir just three points um the first one is um on uh, malaysia's uh you know how we how we project ourselves to the world um our principles our our domestic principles um how we want the world to view us um that's that's the first thing 
Second thing is on uh, parliament, the position of parliament. Uh, I think that uh, it is so important to, to, have, to help Malaysians understand why it is so important for them to know what is happening in terms of Malaysia's stand on foreign policy and not just Wisma Putra making statements and Malaysians have no clue what's going on. And, that, and the third would be, of course, on media. Uh, I think even the, our fourth estate media houses um, are not well versed in how to report on these sort of issues. They just copy paste what happens everywhere in the world. And we all know that domestic press um, have a certain tend a tendency to lean towards either side and the way of reporting also influences how we look at um, the world. So um, I think that coming back to parliament, uh, I, I, I wish to see more MPs hold the government accountable on their stand and their viewpoint. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, if there's a crisis, a war, the two biggest casualties are women and children. And we often don't talk about them enough because they fall through the cracks. We talk about big issues like defence, like military, like weapons, like economy, like food security. But these are the things that we really need to, to look into as well. So parliament, media and the country stand and principles on what be, we believe in. Thank you, Puan Kashri. And I would like to take this opportunity to really express my gratitude, my appreciation to all the three panellists. I think we had a very uh, extensive discussion, but perhaps we are merely scratching the surface of sure. the issue here. We, we, we really can't have all these issues in, in one particular round of discussion. Mm. But we do understand that the, the things that we need to do, the approach that we need to take to future-proof Malaysia mm. on the foreign policy challenges in the world. So uh, I, perhaps I just want to end our session today with a particular quote by the Indian Foreign Minister. I, this quote struck me very much to when he said that Europe has to grow out of the mindset that its problem are the world's problem, but the world's problem are not Europe's problem. So I, I leave us with that. Perhaps we can. There will be other opportunity to. To listen to yeah. the panelists again to expand further on this issue. Perhaps we could have a more focused discussion about this. But for today, thank you very much for your very enlightening discussion. And I hope we we would have uh, other opportunity about this in the future. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.